Hi, my name's Christian, and it is a pleasure for me to demonstrate the very unique Swift sealing tool for ARCHICAD. This tool is special for several reasons. Firstly, the brief was actually defined by a group of elite ARCHICAD users from around the globe. Most of you will know several of these people in this list. If you do not, I suggest you look them up on Twitter and follow them. It will definitely be worth your while. One of the first things you'll notice about this tool is that most of the functions have been kept in the 2D and 3D working environments. So you do not need to go into the user interface every time you want to change something. Basically, we've tried to achieve a sort of push-pull freeform modeling process. The crux of this process is a movable hotspot down in the left corner that allows you to toggle between different phases of the configuring process. Here, we have the guides off. If we go down one, we open up the guides for the shape and openings. From there, we go through joint configurations, boundary features, and the hangers. Let's just have a quick look at this in 3D. As you can see, there are several components to this tool. If we zoom in a little closer, firstly, we have the panel. Then we have the spring T section, which holds the panel. Above that, we have the main channel, which is then connected to the hanger, and that is also connected to another frame. You can turn on and off either of these elements individually, so you do not have to use the complete system. You can use separate components of the system. We also have a series of features on the border for bulkheads, cornices, and simple joint configurations. Okay, let's go play around with some of the functions. We'll start at the beginning as it's a logical place. Shape and opening. So when you start with the shape, you start with a rectangle. However, this rectangle is actually a polygon which you can edit by the nodes. You can grab corners and drag them in. You can also, if you zoom in close, you'll see there's an add node and a curve function. So you can also add nodes and curves to each border. Select the add node. Stretch it up. Select the curve. And curve it out. Or, if you like, you can also curve it in. We'll just leave it curved out for now. So let's have a look at this in 3D. So now you can see that each feature configures to that polygon. Once you have defined your shape, you can then add holes. Grab this node and stretch it along to add more and more holes. Let's add three holes for now and I'll show you how we can then manipulate each hole. So the first one that appears is the rectangle. You can see that there are a couple extras down here, but they are yet to assume their shapes. We use this first node to position and the second node to adjust the size. For the next one, we'll just grab it and chuck it into a random space and same with the third. Now you may have also noticed another function beneath the hole. This allows you to toggle between a rectangular opening, a circular opening, or turn the hole off. So if you go to circular, this is actually an elliptical shape, so you can adjust either width separately. You can then move on to your next hole. So these holes can be configured for certain features, or they can be used simply to cut holes for columns. If you decide you do not want a specific hole, then it's simply a matter of dragging the node down to the offsetting, and that hole will disappear. If you decide you want it back, obviously, you can turn it back on and choose your shape. Let's have another look in 3D. Okay, so you can see that the holes cut right through every aspect. Now you'll notice there's a border feature here, and there isn't one yet defined for these. We can define them which I'll show you shortly. The next function, once you've done the shapes and openings, is to go down to the joints. Now there are several different options for these joints. You can obviously position them. They have different values at the top and at the bottom so that you can actually skew the joints. Or you can go into the settings, select the panel design page, and you can arrange your panels based on some sort of logical system. You can set them to be equidistance apart. If we just follow this in 2D, so we can see the effects.
As you can see, that squares off the joints. Or you can use a repetitive function for up to three different panel sizes. So if I set this to three, we can then nominate a sequence. Let's say 400, 600, and 800. So you can see the effects of that. That function is also available for the vertical elements. You can also use these buttons here to offset your panels, but there is a more friendly movable hotspot in the 2D environment. You can also use the pitch, but once again, there's a more friendly function in the 3D environment. Click OK. Here in the middle, we have our offset function. And as you can see, that moves the joints around and you can position them based on any logical origin. Once you have designed your panel configuration, you can then go to the settings for each individual element. If we just have a closer look at this in 3D, there are two parts to the framing system here. We have the spring T, and we also have a main channel above that. If we have a look in 2D, these symbols represent different configurations. So the first option is to have the frame on, and the second option is to have the frame off, so that you only have the spring T. So let's just have a look at that. If I leave this very left and very right ones on, and turn the middle ones off, simply by dragging these nodes. Then I go and have a look in 3D. You can now see the arrangement where the frame is only present on the very left and very right T's. Obviously that function is also available for your horizontal elements. There is another function down here where you can control the configuration of the gap. So if you have a look in 3D, There is associated gap with the framing element. Let me just show you something so we can make this a little bit more visible. We go into the geometry, select, select our spring T and offset its Z position by the thickness of the panel, which I know to be eight. So I'll select eight, click OK. Now you can see the framing element is actually above the panel and you have the exposed gap. Back to the 2D, and I can actually turn these gaps off individually. Have a look in 3D. And you can see those gaps have now disappeared. Once again, that function is also available for the horizontal elements. And you can see as we have removed the gaps, so too has a 2D representation of those gaps disappeared. Once you have defined the configuration of your panels, and the framing elements above, you then move to the next stage, boundary features. In the boundary features, you define the components for each edge. We have a global function down here so that you can affect, obviously, a global change. Let's just turn that on first. So you can see using this hotspot, the global function is set to bulkhead. Let's leave it at that. Let's have a quick look in 3D. So you can see there is now a bulkhead element surrounding the complete system. Back to the 2D, we can now turn this global feature off and then go around and select between bulkhead, cornice, joint and none for each individual boundary. Let's just set a couple to corners for demonstration and we might as well set one to joint as well. And then of course one to none so that we can see everything. Now when we have a look in 3D, you can see the structure of the bulkhead, which is an L frame with a panel, the cornice is a simple rectangular section, and the joint follows the same sizing options as our spring T, but is an L shape. And if we go have a look at none, obviously there is nothing. While we're here, we can set the boundary features for the holes as well. You can see this hole was already set to a bulkhead. So if you come up and set this hole over here, we set that to a cornice. And this one, we'll just increase the size a little bit so it's a bit more obvious and set it to the joint. Now have another look in 3D. So you can see a cornice, bulkhead, and the spring T, but in an L shape. Okay, so we're almost there with the configuration of the full geometry. The last element we need to configure are the hangers. Now, there are a whole series of options for the hangers, 
so we have some global controls to make it a little bit easier. We can show just the junction hangers, we can show intermediate, and we can also show hangers at the end. If I turn them all on, have a look in 3D, and you can see you have quite an extensive number of hanger elements, many of which we need to now turn off. These values down here are not a global setting. They're just something that affects a change globally, but only temporarily. You can then go and individually turn on and off individual hangers, simply by grabbing this node and stretching it to the off position. You can also move the hangers along the frame. For this setup, I would probably turn intermediate off, only have the junction hangers and have the joint end hangers. I would then find which of my elements actually have a frame and the hangers would extend only to the frame. And obviously I would need to go in and turn the hangers off that are in these holes. Very simply, off, off. This one, rather than turning off, I might move it to the edge here. So there is a little bit more structural support. That's in a pretty good position, that one. And I can do the same for all these elements too. So you have quite a lot of flexibility in how you configure these elements. That basically covers the highly flexible configuration functions for your ceiling system. However, there is still a lot more to this tool. Let's just have a look at the user interface first. We'll just go back to the beginning. First, we have this lovely image, courtesy of Link Architecture in Sweden. Next, we move into the panel configuration function, which you saw earlier. From there, we go to the component geometry. So in here, you can actually define the different shapes and sizes of the individual elements. These are all buttons. So you configure each element one at a time. If we go to frame first, we can actually turn the frame element off. Now this frame is, um, it's, it's, not the, it's not the channel frame of a typical ceiling system. It's actually an extra frame that the hangers might drop down from. So typically this element will not be needed. So you turn that off. If you do need it, you can obviously define the depth and the width of that element. Hanger. You can turn all hangers off globally. That will not affect the on off configurations you have defined. It just switches them all off. And then when you switch them all back on, that configuration will still be present. You can nominate between a rectangular or circular. And obviously you can define the width, the depth, and most importantly, the height of the hanger. For the main channel, you have simple width and height functions. For the spring T element, you can nominate between a simple rectangular section or a T section as you saw. For this element, there is also the offset that I demonstrated earlier. So you can position the T in relation to the panel based on the type of system you want to use. You then obviously have all the typical elements for size, height, width, and then the different thicknesses of the T stem. Corners, once again, you have the Z offset. So you can position that so that the panel butts into it or so that the panel goes over the top of it. And then you can also set the depth and the width. For the bulkhead section, once again, you have the Z offset position so that you can position it relative to the panel based on your design. You also have the thickness of the panel element and then you have the heights. Now each separate boundary can have an independent height for that bulkhead. I'll show you this in 3D because there's actually a more friendly way to configure this using a movable hotspot. So if I go back to 2D, go to my boundary features, set them to global, make sure it's on bulkhead, then go and have a look in 3D. You can see these hotspots on the corner actually adjust the height individually of each bulkhead. So you can go right around the design and configure it however you desire. There is also a bulkhead height for the whole element. For the panel, once again, you have the Z position and a thickness. And for the panel gap, you simply have the width of the gap. The benefit of this system 
is that you actually don't have to use it for a tiling sealing system. You can use it for simple plasterboard. To do that, you simply go to the 2D, go up to your joints, and turn off all your gaps. Perhaps I should have a global feature for this, as this could get quite tedious. Have a look at that in 3D now. And you can see that it is a single panel. Once you have defined your component geometry, you then move along to the representation. And in here you can control the 2D representation, your materials, and the sectional attributes of each individual element. In the materials, it is important to note that the panel system uses an array function. In this array, you define the material for each panel individually. Having it set up like this allows you to quickly make changes. There is also a single material function, but we can turn that off and we can do an alternating pattern. With an alternating pattern, you just first choose the other colour that you want. Let's go for something bright and quite scary. And then you can simply copy that and paste it on an alternating grid. Now once you've configured all those individual elements, your shape, your design, your panel patterns, um, all those, all the features, we then have a series of other functions that make this tool very handy. Go to your model view option settings and you have a resolution control. Basically in here you can define the detail of the geometry by choosing fine, medium and coarse and by setting a resolution. At the moment we have it at fine. Let's have a look at the 3D first. If I set that to medium, click OK, you can now see that a series of the elements actually either disappear or become very flat two-dimensional elements. This reduces the polygon count significantly. You can actually take this one step further and set it to coarse. Click OK. And now we even have our spring tees disappear and we have a very simple panel. This will allow you to use this tool to an extensive level on very large projects without slowing your file down. Okay, now let's have a look at the 2D. I'm going to actually turn these gaps back on because I kind of need them to demonstrate the 2D levels of detail. As you can see, the 2D representation is quite detailed. I'll just turn these guides off so that we can see it as it would be documented. It's quite detailed. If you have a fairly extensive system, you're gonna end up with some fairly thick line work throughout your documentation. So we go back to our resolution settings and we change that from fine to medium. Now it becomes very simple line work. And this would probably be the typical representation that you would use. We can take this one step further and actually change it to coarse. Click OK. And that gets rid of all the panel design within. So if you're looking at the drawing at say, a one to 500, one to 1000, you don't end up with a blurry little blodge in the middle of your drawing. You can download this tool directly from our website. And if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to contact us.